Colonel Lee uh, Ellis, uh, Vietnam POW, is a nationally recognized expert and much sought-after speaker on leadership to public and private uh, organization. He's the author of the new award-winning book, Leading with Honor. Colonel Ellis, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. Well, thank you. It's good to be with you. And my understanding is just a few days ago, it was the 40th anniversary of you getting out of the Hanoi Hilton. Well, that's right. It was uh, just a few days ago, and uh, I'll tell you, I've been celebrating all year, but it really peaked uh, this past week, and it's still still lasting. Uh, just the thought of freedom and being outside, being able to make choices, being home with family, and being in this country all are so important, and uh, it's been very exciting. Now, for those uh, younger listeners, would you tell them what the Hanoi Hilton is? Yeah. Uh, It was actually a French fortress prison downtown Hanoi, built in the early 1900s. It occupied an entire block, 15-foot high walls, 5-foot thick, with guard towers and machine guns at all the corners, and no one ever escaped. Mm. And and tell us a little bit about your story, uh, how you got there, how you ended up getting out. Sure. I was a fighter pilot flying over the southern part of North Vietnam, which would have been in, which was enemy territory. Uh, it was a pretty well defended area, and uh, my airplane was hit, blew up into several pieces. And fortunately, my partner and I were able to get out. And unfortunately, we were immediately captured and then taken to Hanoi. What was it like uh, when you got to the Hanoi Hilton? Well, it was uh, that's kind of your worst professional and personal nightmare to be in a, a communist uh, POW camp in uh, deep in the heart of the country land there. Uh, it was scary. Obviously, you know, I was uh, I was fine until they actually captured me in hand, and then you know the, the trauma hits, the fear. But you you have a lot to cling to, and uh, I had my personal faith, my uh, training. And then we had great leadership as we were able to connect with some of the leaders there that were very courageous and set a great example for us. And then through that, we built teamwork, even though it was covert communication. Do you feel like uh, that the story of what took place there has ever really been told? Well, pieces of it individually have. uh, And there's a couple of... uh, of uh, historical books out about it, that it was well told, but most people have never read those. And so with my book, I tried to capture, uh, to tell the story, but also to pull the lessons about leadership and life for that we can use today. Now, I've heard the story of the, the secret of communication. Can you describe it? Well, we were not allowed to communicate with the other cell blocks or even the cells next door. They had guards in the hallways, and if they caught you communicating, talking out loud, um, tapping on the walls, if they caught you tapping on the walls, any of that uh, would probably lead to torture, typically, or isolation in in, uh, solitary confinement. So we had to be very covert in our communication. So we did have a tap code that we could tap on the wall very softly to the ones next door. My first cell didn't have any walls next door. It was... uh, an isolated cell, so it didn't have adjoining walls with anyone else. But eventually, we were able to overcome all that, being uh, somewhat entrepreneurial and risk takers. We were able to connect, and sometimes it was very slow, but we were able to communicate with other rooms and pass the word of how we were doing and what the treatment was and what the policies were, and really built a very tight team. What were the conditions like in that prison? Well, the first nine months I was there, uh, I was in a cell that was six and a half by seven feet. That's like a very small walk-in closet or a small bathroom in the 1950s. And and there were three other guys in there, and our bathroom was a a three-and-a-half-gallon bucket. We got fed twice a day, pumpkin soup for six months, turnip green soup, uh, or sewer greens, actually, we call them sewer greens, for three months, and cabbage soup for three months with a piece of bread or a cup of rice. So it was pretty sparse. The treatment uh, varied, but uh, torture was generally going on in the camp somewhere the first three years I was there. And then the last two years, thanks to the American people uh, and a change in leadership in, in the north there, uh, our treatment did improve. What uh, I, You know, you hear stories like this you, in, in that tiny little room with three other people. How do you maintain your sanity? Well, I think it's survival, yeah. and uh, you, you you kind of learn what you can and can't do, and you're trying to work together to get along as best you can, and we did get along for the most part very well. And you're really uh, supporting yourself, you, you know, you support each other because it's us against them. Yeah. The the other part of that is you had to spend a lot of time every day just figuring out things to keep your mind occupied, uh, which we, you know, mental games. I played golf courses in my head. I did math problems. I memorized poems from my uh, cellmate, uh, memorized Bible verses from my cellmate, and passed others to another cellmate. So we're always trying to keep busy. We just live day to day. 
Colonel Lee Ellis. The book is Leading with Honor. Colonel Ellis, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Ernie and Rachel. Good talking with you. Have a good one. You too.